Big welcome to Clinica London's webinar by Greg Richardson. Greg is an orthoptist, but he is a specialist orthoptist, not only in children and adults, but also in neuroophthalmology. He uh, trained initially in Sheffield, and he will tell you a little bit about himself in a minute. And then he was at Moorfields, and he did a lot of glaucoma work. And he's now the head orthoptist in Reading, and he works at Clinica London. He supports, it gives immense support to Naz Raouf, who is our pediatric ophthalmologist and neuro-ophthalmologist. Naz will be talking in the autumn, but today it's Greg's night. And thank you so much. We've already got 60 people uh, come in and people are still coming in on the numbers. This is the longest day of the year, and it's a beautiful sunny evening. And I thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. Over to Greg now. Excellent. Um, okay, so my name's Greg. Um, so I'm uh, a consultant orthoptist at Clinica London, um, but I'm also the head of orthoptics and optometry at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading and Prince Charles Eye Unit in Windsor. Um, prior to my current role, I worked at the Royal London um, in Whitechapel um, and St. Thomas's, and I've also done a lot of research in glaucoma um, in the Glaucoma Research Unit at Moorfields. Um, but uh, today's, the aim of today's presentation really is to have a little masterclass in amblyopia and strabismus. So the aims of today really to understand amblyopia, um, then to understand what binocular vision is and the different grades of binocular vision. And then we'll go through the diagnosis and management of a few different types of esotropia, um, similarly with exotropia, and then if would we'll also go over some mechanical types of strabismus. But I thought we'd start with uh, amblyopia um, to start us off. So I don't know how people's Greek are, Greek is, um, but uh, the top here, so amblyopia comes from the Greek for um, amblyos and opia, which is uh, blunt vision. So amblyopia is poor vision um, or decreased vision in one or both eyes, which happens uh, due to abnormal visual development in infancy or in childhood. So there are various types of amblyopia which can be caused by a variety of different conditions. These can be refractive, strabismic, or stimulus deprivation. So the visual system is immature at birth. Um, development of the eyes, visual pathways, and cortical visual processing is dependent upon some complex interactions between growth and visual experience. This um, whole process is vulnerable to disruption during the critical period of visual development, which is usually from around about birth to seven years of age, but can be a little bit beyond seven. Um, but any disruption of development during this period can cause a permanent defect in a child's vision um, if the problem remains untreated. So what can an infant see? So this graph just gives us an, an idea as to, to how much a child is able to see. You can see that when they're, when they're first born, their visual acuity in logmar is approximately 1.6 logmar. Um, by three months of age, their vision is about 660, so one logmar. Um, at six months of age, it's about 630. And at a year of age, they're around about 615. So you can see that as they're, as they're growing, their vision is developing, but we don't actually expect to see normal adult level vision until they're much older. So lovely picture of me um, in my first four months of life. So at this age, um, visual acuity is developing rapidly. Um, by eight weeks of age, an infant begins to focus on faces. Um, and in the first two months of eye, in the first two months, the eyes are not very well coordinated and may wander occasionally or appear intermittently crossed. So that can be what we call a pseudo squint. Um, and it's where the eyes start, can sometimes look a little bit crossed at times, um, but it's not a true squint. An infant begins following moving objects and will reach out for things from around about four months of age. So at four months of age, um, the eyes become able to work together. You start to get, develop binocular vision and start to see things in depth and appreciate things in 3D. You also gain some control of your eye movements um, and the visual acuity continues to improve rapidly. Um, at around about five months of age, color vision is thought to be pretty good.
so there we go. There's, there's my uh, probably my first ophthalmoscope on the right hand side there. Um, but from about three to five years of age, um, we we start to notice an adult level of vision. Um, acuity is usually around 0 0.2 to 0 0.1 logma. So there, like I say, there are different types of amblyopia. So there's refractive amblyopia, and and this is this occurs due to uncorrected bilateral or an isometropic refractive error. It's often not detected until um, children are at school um, in their school vision screening, which happens at the age of four to five years. Um, and re refractive amblyopia can be categorized into one of three different types. So amotropic, anisometropic, or meridional. So amotropic being bilateral uncorrected refractive error, anisometropic obviously being a difference in a prescription, and meridional um, astigmatic prescription. So strabismic amblyopia occurs in the presence of a misalignment of the eyes. Um, so when an eye is misaligned, the brain switches off the input into the deviated eye. And that's why the vision doesn't develop so well in that eye. So the final main type of amblyopia is stimulus deprivation amblyopia. And this occurs when there's a physical barrier to visual development. And that can be caused by a number of conditions, including ptosis or congenital cataract, um, but it's much harder to treat. Um, than other types of amblyopia. So how do we treat amblyopia? The first step is always to give a full refractive adaptation, giving the full cyclopedic refraction. Now studies have shown that actually children require a full 18 weeks of full-time glasses wear um, before we start thinking about further types of um, amblyopia therapy. Um, as in many cases, the vision will improve without further need for, for patching or other forms of, of treatment. So there are different types of amblyopia therapy, and the most common one that we give is patching. And then that's where we would wear a patch over the non-amblyopic eye, usually for around about two to four hours a day. And that promotes use of the amblyopic eye and therefore development of the vision in that eye. We can also give atropine occlusion. Um, so we use 1% atropine in the non-amblyopic eye. And usually we would give that on a, one drop on a Saturday, one drop on a Sunday, and as we know, atropine is a very strong drop and it will blur the vision in that eye for the majority of the next week. Um, and actually a PEDIC study in 2009 demonstrated that weekend atropine was a, as effective as patching. Um, and then the last one, optical penalization, which is where we blur the vision in the non-amblyopic eye. It tends not to work quite so well. Um, and the reason being children would tend to look over the top of their glasses all the time and try and use their non-amblyopic eye. <clears throat> In general, we have until the visual system has matured um, to treat um, amblyopia, and that's usually by around about seven or eight years of age. However, in treatment naive individuals, amblyopia therapy can be successful even in teens, providing compliance is good. Um, and I've seen, children, I've seen teenagers up to sort of 15 that have actually responded very well to patching when they've not been treated previously. So we'll go on to the first uh, poll. Um, so let's see if I can launch this. Uh, has that worked? So the first question is, at, at what age does the children, do children start to focus on faces? So almost there, I'll give you a couple more minutes just to finish answering that one. Anymore. Okay, I think let's let's end that poll there. So let's share the results. So you're correct. So the um, at what age do children start to focus on faces? So actually, it's around about eight weeks of age they start to focus on faces. Good. Um, and I think we move straight on to the next uh, poll. Actually. So the second question, so how many types of refractive amblyopia are there? Um, hopefully a nice, quick and easy one.
just a few more answers to come in. Okay. Let's end that one there. So, uh, yep, yeah, so there are three types of uh, refractive amblyopia. So there's um, anisometropic, amotropic, and meridional. Okay. Did that work? Right. How do I go back? So let's close that. <clears throat> I'll take it off. Okay. So the next the next uh, topic that we were going to cover was binocular vision. Um, so there are different grades of binocular vision. So the the lowest form of binocular vision is simultaneous perception. So that's the ability to see um, a different image in either eye at the same time. Once you move on to, to fusion, sensory fusion, this is where you start to get very gross binocular single vision. And that's where your brain is able to superimpose two images, two similar images to fuse those. Motor fusion is where we are able to maintain that through, um, a, through multiple different vergence uh, movements. And then stereopsis is of course, 3D vision. There we Greg, go. may I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, so somebody is, Rajivi is asking, so up to what age would you suggest we can still refer amblyopic children to the hospital eye service? So I think at any age, um, providing they've not had treatment previously. Um, so I would say up to probably up to around 11 or 12, um, we're not so likely to see improvements in vision uh, with amblyopia therapy after about that age um, unless they've got very dense amblyopia and then you might get their vision up a little bit you're probably never going to get it quite up to up to sort of the same level as the non-amblyopic eye hopefully that answers your question um, so simultaneous perception um, is the ability of both eyes to perceive simultaneously two images one formed on each retina so simultaneous perception of the two images formed on corresponding areas with the projection of these images to the same position in space is called superimposition. So sensory fusion, and this looks like a very complex diagram, um, but it's the ability to perceive two similar images as one single visual image. Um, so the, the images must not only must be located on corresponding retinal areas, but also should be sufficiently similar with respect to size, brightness and sharpness. Um, so it's very difficult to, to fuse images that are um, different sizes, um, different brightnesses, um, or a blurry image. So actually, if you're amblyopic, then it's very difficult for you to, to develop sensory fusion. Motor fusion. Um, so this is the ability to maintain sensory fusion through a range of vergence movements. So that's forcing the eyes into either a convergent position or a divergent position. And how do we do that? That's usually through a prism fusion range, um, which we do using a prism bar, um, seeing how well children overcome um, base out and base in prisms respectively. Um, or we can do this on the synoptophore, which maybe sounds a little bit archaic, but I'm quite a big fan of the synoptophore. Um, so stereopsis, so this is the perception of depth and three-dimensional structure through binocular vision. And because our eyes are located at different lateral positions on the head, binocular vision results in two slightly different images projected to the retinas of the eyes. And that results in a three-dimensional image being perceived when normal retinal correspondence exists. So in terms of tests for binocular vision, um, there's a few different ones here. So the top uh, left, we've... Oh, oh, oh dear. Oh, there we go. So um, the top left, we've got uh, Worth's light. So that's the, the red and the green lights. And that's a test for sensory fusion. Um, you won't be able to assess motor fusion with this. Um, the next one along is the uh, Frisbee stereo test. And this is a pretty common one, very well used in, in orthoptic practice um, and allows us to measure um, a stereo acuity to around about 55 seconds of arc, 40 seconds of arc. Then we've got Wirt's stereo test. It's, with Wirt, it's not the most reliable. There's quite a lot of monocular cues, particularly if you're looking at the circles in the top left. Um, and the reason is you can just see the overlap of the circles there. Below that is Bagalini glasses. 
Um, so this is a test for um, sensory fusion. Again, you're not going to get motor fusion with this one. And then moving along underneath, uh, or sort of next to that is Lang stereo test. And that's very, very good for, for young children who just need to point to, point to the images um, or say what the images are. And again, there's quite a lot of monocular cues because of the blurring that the, the images give, um, but it's very useful in kind of screening for defects. And lastly, that, that slightly complicated looking contraption in the corner is the synoptophore. Um, and the synoptophore is really great because actually you can measure, um, so you can measure squints, you can measure horizontal, vertical, cyclorotatory squints all at the same time. Um, you can also test for sensory fusion, simultaneous perception, motor fusion, and stereopsis on the synoptophore. But you can also do that in nine positions of gaze. Um, so it's a really useful piece of kit and isn't used enough in my opinion. So we'll move on to the next uh, question in the poll. So, um, so at what age is binocular vision developed? So let's, uh, so let's launch that one. Greg, please click on share results so um, because not everybody can see what me and you can see. Ah, right. Okay. That's Apologies. what it means. So when they're finished, just Fine. share the results. Thank you. So, we're at 81 people. Let's see if anyone else is going to reply. Okay. So we'll end that one. So if I share those results, did that work? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So you can see, so the majority of you have said um, four months of age. And yes, it's it's from four months of age. That's when we really sort of have binocular vision developing. It's a, maybe a little bit of a trick question because it can develop a little bit beyond four months of age. So I wouldn't beat yourself up if you went for longer than that stop that one and then the next question was um so which grade of binocular vision can be measured using the synoptophore give you a couple of minutes 30 seconds or so I think that's probably everyone. So again, yeah, um, you can measure all of the above. So as I said, there are different slides that you can use on the synoptophore and you can measure simultaneous perception, mode diffusion and stereopsis. So you can actually measure all, all three of those. Okay. So were there any questions on uh, binocular vision? before I move on. Okay, we'll move on to, to esotropia. So this looks very complex, um, but I thought we would kind of go over the classification of, classification of esotropia. Um, so we can break it down into either constant esotropia or intermittent esotropia. Um, and again, these can be broken down even further. <clears throat> so constant esotropia, the, the, circled, the circled ones are the ones that we're going to go into a little bit more depth about, but the main type of constant esotropia, the main types of constant esotropia that we see are infantile esotropia um, and partially accommodative esotropia. But you can also get um, some unusual types of esotropia, so nystagmus blockage syndrome, um, esotropia associated with myopia, um, acquired non-accommodative esotropia. And then microesotropia is an esotropia with abnormal retinal correspondence and so they have some very gross binocular function despite a very small esotropia. And then intermittent esotropias, um, so we can break these down further into accommodative and non-accommodative types. Um, the accommodative types are the two that we're going to go through today, so freely accommodative esotropia and convergent success, um, but there's also some, un again, unusual types, so cyclic esotropia um, and that 
is an alternate day type esotropia. So one day they'll have a, a squint and the next day they won't. And actually, weirdly, I've seen a few of those over the last year, and it's, it's quite an unusual one. Um, we've also got near esotropia, where the eyes are straight in the distance, but they're squinting for near. Um, and then distance esotropia, where someone is squinting in the distance, but their eyes are nice and straight for near. So infantile esotropia, usually onsets in the first six months of life. It's a large angle esotropia. So these children have a really marked, obvious squint. Often it's alternating rather than having a dominant eye, um, and therefore they're less likely to, be, to develop amblyopia than some other types of squint. There are a number of associated features that are quite, or that are diagnostic of an infantile esotropia. Um, so one of those is dissociated vertical deviation, and that's where when you do your cover test, the eye under the cover drifts up, regardless of which eye it is. So it could be the right eye that's drifting up or it could be the left eye, and it, it swaps. Um, so it's, it's quite, typical of an infantile esotropia. Um, manifest latent nystagmus. So this is where you have very fine nystagmus where a child is looking straight ahead. Um, but as soon as you cover one eye, that nystagmus increases. Children also develop cross fixation. And that's where they, when they look across to one side, they use the eye that's squinting to look across their nose. So when they look over to the left, they're going to look with their right eye. And when they look across to the right, they look with their left eye. And that can make it quite difficult to demonstrate abduction and make sure that they've not got a, a bilateral sick. Um, so it's, it's possible to do, and we often kind of pick babies up to swing them and make sure that their, their abduction is full um, or just trying, trying to get their attention. It's not, not always easy. Um, and the last classic feature is abnormal nasal to temporal optokinetic response. Um, and this is where we get the optokinetic drum out, so the black and white stripes on a drum that we rotate, and you'll see an abnormal OKM response, essentially. Um, and that's always nasal to temporal. Their temporal to nasal OKM response is completely normal. Um, kids with an infantile esotropia usually have normal refractive error. They might have very mild type of um, but normally they don't need glasses. Um, and there's no ocular pathology associated. The main differential diagnosis in um, infantile esotropia is a secondary sensory esotropia. So that's usually due to poor acuity, um, uh, which could be as a result of congenital cataract or retinoblastoma. Um, usually that would be unilateral. So you wouldn't get the alternating type squint that you do with the infantile esotropia. The other main differential diagnosis is a nystagmus, nystagmus blockage syndrome. And that's where children with horizontal congenital nystagmus will often overconverge to dampen their nystagmus and gain better acuity. Um, and we know that nystagmus dampens on convergence and some children learn this quite early on. And it looks like they've got an esotropia, but actually it's, when you can break down their esotropia, you realize they've just got um, congenital idiopathic nystagmus. So there are, there are different types of treatment for um, an infantile esotropia. So we can do bimedial rectus Botox injections um, to try and relax the eyes out. Um, but most children are going to go on to need surgery. Um, and that could be either a bimedial, bimedial rectus recession or a unilateral medial rectus recession and lateral rectus resection. I can see that there's a question there and I don't know whether it's is that. Um, so um, I'll, I'll answer the question um, at, sort of at the end of the section, I think. Um, so there are, two, there are two schools of thought on when we should operate for, um, uh, for infantile esotropia. So early surgery or doing later surgery. And studies tend to show that if you do surgery earlier, but within sort of six to 11 months of age, they're more likely to develop stereopsis and um, because you're catching them that much earlier. Um, however, the alignment, so the motor outcome is much better if you do later surgery after 18 months of age. So the next type of esotropia we'll go through is fully accommodative esotropia. So this usually onsets around two or three years of age when children start focusing. It's often associated or usually associated with moderate to high hypermetropia. 
And with glasses, their esotropia completely disappears and they develop normal binocular vision. Without their glasses, they can maintain straight eyes when they're not accommodating. However, when they accommodate, they become a moderate angle esotropia. So if you have a look here, you can see that the child on, or on, the, on the left here, the esotropia is present when they're not wearing their glasses, but as soon as they put their glasses on, the eyes are nice and straight. So in terms of treatment for this, we would always give the full cyclopedic refraction and give them a full 18 weeks of refractive adaptation. As, as they develop binocular vision, often they don't require amblyopia therapy. If they do, it's usually only minimal amblyopia therapy. And as I said before, children can learn to control their esotropia without their glasses um, by allowing their vision to go blurry. And this is known as treat, teaching them to sort of misty and clear. And it's really useful for school photos in older children who maybe don't want to be wearing the glasses. The next one is partially accommodative esotropia, and it has very similar features to a fully accommodative esotropia. However, the eso doesn't fully disappear with the glasses. There's often a residual small angle esotropia. Um, children often have inferior oblique overactions associated with this, and they're more likely to require amblyopia therapy as their esotropia is still present with their glasses. They may be also benefit from some surgical intervention for the angle of the squint that's present with their glasses on. Um, and that would usually be a unilateral medial rectus recession and lateral rectus resection. So as you can see here, without the glasses, there's a moderate angle left esotropia, um, but with the hypermotropic correction, the esotropia has reduced in size, but it's still there. And then the last one that we're going to go through is convergence excess esotropia. Um, so this, again, it's an accommodative type of esotropia um, with and with full cyclopedic refraction, they can maintain straight eyes with binocular vision in the distance, but they retain a manifest esotropia for near. So essentially their accommodative convergence to accommodation ratio is too high. And normal, the normal range for that is around about three, three to five, or so between three and five to one. <clears throat> so how do we manage convergence excess esotropia? So the conservative types of management include bifocal glasses um, and the aim of this is really to reduce the amount of accommodation and therefore overconvergence that the child is doing for near. We would always give them an executive bifocal that's usually set relatively high. And the higher bifocal segment means that children are more likely to use this correctly. We see a number of kids come back um, with bifocals that just are given a DSEG and it's just not good enough for them to control their, for them to control their esotropia for near. So if they're given, if a child is given bifocals, then usually it would be um, an executive bifocal that's needed with quite a high segment. In terms of surgical management, most surgeons prefer to undertake a bimedial rectus recession. And the reason we do that is that the medial recti acts more for near. So undertaking surgery to weaken these muscles is usually more effective than a recess resect procedure um, where you're more likely to get some distance um, effect as well. Ooh. So let's move on to... So the next poll, let's stop that one there. So the first question is, uh, which of these is not a feature of infantile esotropia? Give it another 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's probably about it. So we'll end that poll. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Global traction is not a feature of infantile esotropia, but manifest latent nystagmus, cross fixation, and associated vertical deviation are. And then the next question, let's stop that one. So which type of esotropia can be managed with bifocal glasses? Okay. 
think we're probably just about there. Okay. Absolutely. Convergence excess hesotropia is the is the one that uh, um, can be managed with bifocal glasses. Okay. Oh, hold on. And sorry, there's one more. So um, let me just launch that one. Um, can you can you see that there? Can you see the picture there? Um, oh, why is this? That's not. Let's see if that one will launch now. There we go. Um, so this is a one-year-old child. What's their diagnosis? You have a look at them. Give you a little bit longer for this one. I think that's probably about everyone. Okay, let's end that one there. So um, you're right. Yes, this is a this is a pseudo strabismus, so a pseudo squint, pseudo squint. So you can see here what we're really looking at is the reflections of light on the cornea, um, and in relation to the iris. And this actually is a um, they're nice and central and symmetrical. You can see that this child has sort of quite a broad bridge to their nose. Um, and epicanthic folds and it looks like this eyes shot around a lot further when they look slightly over to one side um but this is normal um this is what we call a pseudo strabismus um and this chart has completely a uh, normal binocular vision okay so let's in terms of questions so um so the first question so what would you prescribe for moderate myopia with esotropia um, I guess it's it depends on depends on what their um, myopia is, but in general, or and how old the child is. But I would say probably you'd want to give them their full myopic prescription. Um, you could probably aim to reduce that in a slightly younger child, um, but in general, you would you would probably still give their you want you don't want to inhibit their visual development. So I would say you'd give them the the myopia first. We can deal with the esotropia as needed. Um, but I think really if they've got reduced vision and they're myopic, then I'd probably give them the glasses. Um, so Rajvi's said, is there an age when you might consider not giving full cyclopedic refraction when a patient has a fully accommodative esotropia? Usually we usually they need their full cyclopedic refraction um, to help them maintain binocularity. Um, if they're a little bit older and you can do a subjective refraction and you can reduce their plus down a little bit. Um, then you can check their maintaining binocular vision when you're reducing their reducing their plus. Um, but in general, we'd probably still give them the maximum plus that you're finding um, usually. Um, and then someone said, "What type of amblyopia therapy is most effective?" Um, actually, I mean, between patching and uh, atropine, they've both been shown to be as good as one another. Um, in practice, we probably try patching as a first line treatment first of all because it's a because it's a um, a much less invasive um, non pharmacological way of treating amblyopia. Um, but in general, um, we would uh, in, in general we would uh, start patching first of all. But I mean, if if I mean I've got one child that I'm I'm just about to start on some on some uh, atropine therapy. Um, because he's struggled with patching in the past um, so it's and some people want to try atropine because they just don't want the the stigma of wearing a patch um, so both both are as effective as one another and then the last question is that uh, what position would you recommend set height of e-set bifocals for convergence success 
Um, so we would tend to we tend to try and get the. I mean, you're probably talking a little bit more dispensing, optician-y kind of stuff that, than I'm probably than I can probably answer. But uh, but usually quite high. We usually make sure that the the bifocal segment is sort of towards the bottom half of the pupil. Um, so much higher than higher than a DSEG bifocal for presbyopia. Um, and is half an hour of patching a day sufficient? Um, probably not. It depends on the level of acuity, um, but it's better than nothing at all. Um, but usually we would say around about two to four hours of patching a day. Um, we know that over time, actually, um, children benefit from around about 400 hours of patching in total. Um, so obviously, if you're only doing half an hour of patching, they're going to be wearing that patch for a lot longer. Um, but saying that we also say that after around about six hours of patching a day, we don't seem to see huge improvements in their acuity. Okay, we'll move on to uh, exotropia. So you can see here um, an intermittent distance type exotropia. Um, so when this child is fixating in the distance, you can see that exotropia is present, that right eye has drifted outwards, but on near fixation, the eyes look nice and straight. I wouldn't move on. Um, so classification of exotropia. So again, we can break this down into constant or intermittent types. Constant types are either a congenital exotropia or a sensory exotropia. Um, and then intermittent types can be either distance near or non-specific, or the Americans often call this a basic type exotropia. Um, and that really just relates to where the exotropia is occurring. Um, so whether that's in the distance, whether that's in the near, or whether it can be at both near and distance, it's just intermittent. Intermittent distance exotropia can be further broken down into a true type and a simulated type. Um, so a true intermittent exotropia is whether they have a distance exotropia and they have no hidden near angle. Simulated types of intermittent distance exotropia um, or whether where they can have a hidden near angle um, and that's caused by either accommodation or tenacious proximal fusion. Um, we'll, uh, I'm just wondering, I've probably not gone further into that. So um, the way that we tell whether someone has a simulated type or a true type is we'll give them a patch for half an hour, 45 minutes, um, and to see if that breaks down any hidden near angle. And then if it doesn't, then we'll measure their ACA ratio. So that's the ratio of accommodative convergence to accommodation. And if that's high, then that implies that there's a sim or a hidden near angle that's simulated due to accommodation. The reason that's important is because of treatment, a certain, in particular surgical treatment, because a simulated, a simulated type of intermittent distance exotropia, you would treat in the same way as a non-specific or basic type exotropia. We'll move on to management. So there are different, different types of management options. So conservative or non-surgical. So we can give minus lens therapy, which is where we essentially over minus children and to force them to over accommodate and therefore bring their eyes in. Um, we can do alternate occlusion, um, which is where we patch each eye on alternate days and we swap which eye they're patching. And that, that stimulates sort of awareness of the two images that either eye is seeing and therefore stimulates fusion. It sounds a little bit more counterintuitive than, than it actually is. Um, these methods are really good for delaying surgery, but ultimately children are going to need some form of surgery for intermittent exotropia. And um, in terms of surgical management, we target any significant inferior, inferior oblique overactions in the first instance. So often children with intermittent exotropia have what we call a V pattern, which is where their eyes drift out more when they're looking up. And that's usually related to bilateral inferior oblique overactions. So we would aim to reduce that first of all. And then based on the type of exotropia that they've got, we'd either undertake a bilateral lateral rectus recession for a true type or a unilateral lateral rectus recession and medial rectus resection for a simulated or a basic type. As the angle of an intermittent exotropia is um, intermittent, and they've got an element of control, um, it means that 
in terms of what we're aiming to, to do is really just to reduce the size of the squint. So we know that they can already control a 30 diopter face in squint. If you can reduce that to, by 20 diopters to 10, they should be able to control that. Around 50% of children will need a second operation within about five years, um, studies have shown. So in general, we tend to try and wait until kids are a little bit older because we're more likely to get a better surgical outcome. So moving on to uh, secondary or sensory exotropia, this occurs due to poor visual acuity in one eye, um, and it's usually as a result of pathology in the affected eye, such as cataract or retinoblastoma, but it can occur secondary to trauma. In these cases, surgically, the aim would be to overcorrect the angle as the eye is likely to re-diverge over time. So you usually aim to leave them very slightly um, convergent. So if we go to the next poll, so let's, what is that? So approximately what percentage of children will undergoing surgery for an intermittent exotropia will require a second operation within five years? If we get any more answers, 77. Let's end that one there. So, um, so yeah, so around 50% of children are likely to require a, a second operation um, within about five years. And that's usually the figure that we'd quote um, when we're seeing children preoperatively. And um, were there any questions on exotropia before we move on? I've not mentioned heliotropia. Um, no, I haven't mentioned heliotropia. Um, I'm not sure what heliotropia is, if anybody wants to answer. We'll we'll move on to we'll move on to mechanical strabismus. Um, so um, so really, I just wanted to give a quick overview of a few different types of mechanical strabismus. Um, so Duane syndrome. So Duane syndrome is a congenital cranial disinnervation disorder, um, and a branch of the third nerve supplies the lateral rectus, um, and this gives rise to classic features, which usually include restricted abduction um, and global traction. But it's often classified into three types, so one, two, and three. Um, and it's really important to differentiate from other causes of lateral rectus underaction, such as a sixth nerve cause. Um, so classification of Duane's. Um, so in type one, they get a restriction of abduction only, and usually they have an ESO deviation. In type two, they get restriction of adduction only, not addiction, apologies, um, adduction only, um, and they usually get an exo deviation. In type three, children often get a restriction of both abduction and adduction. Usually the abduction is affected more than the adduction and therefore they have a, an ESO deviation. Um, they often have a compensatory head posture as well. So they'll turn their head to one side. Um, and so in types one and three, that's towards the unaffected eye. And in type two, that's towards the affected eye. So if we would have a look at the next condition, so Brown syndrome, um, this is where you get a mechanical restriction of elevation in adduction. So if you have a look here, this child has nice straight eyes in primary position. When they look over to the sides in general, their, their eye movements are not too bad. But if you have a look up here, um, when they're looking up and to the left, that right eye is just not elevating. Um, whereas up and to the right is fine. Commonly, this is congenital. Um, it's sometimes thought to be because of a nodule on the superior oblique tendon, which is inhibiting this from moving through the trochlea. Children often grow out of this, or it becomes less noticeable as they get taller. Um, there are reports that children can notice a clicking sound when the eye manages to look up, and that could be due to a nod the, 
due to this nodule slipping through the trochlea. Um, very occasionally, brow syndrome can be acquired, but in general, this is, this is a, um, a congenital condition. So orbital fractures. So um, just a quick uh, overview of the anatomy of the orbit. So um, there are the main walls, really, you've got the floor, which is made up of the maxilla, the, the uh, medial wall of the orbit, which is um, usually the ethmoid and the, and the lacrimal bones here. Um, you've got the um, frontal bone, which is a big strong bone that forms the forehead. And then the zygoma or zy zygomatic, which is um, the temporal side just here. And again, another big strong bone. Um, orbital fractures, um, are most, the most commonly fractured wall of the orbit is the orbital floor. Um, and this usually occurs following blunt trauma to the globe. Um, there's nowhere for that pressure to go and therefore the floor collapses into the maxillary sinus. Sometimes an extraocular muscle can get caught in that fracture and most commonly that's the inferior rectus. Um, but patients often complain of extreme pain on attempted elevation when the inferior rectus gets trapped in that break. So if we were to have a look at a, at a Hess chart and some eye movements here, you can see that the Hess chart has a classic squashed appearance that you get from um, most mechanical disorders of eye movements. Um, and when you, you can see that when they try and look up, there's, it's restricted, but it's also restricted when they try to look down here. Um, now, be, because when they're trying to look up, the brain is sending more innovation to the, to the muscles on the other side because they all work in pairs, and therefore you get this overacting appearance to, to the right eye. If you have a look here, you can see looking in primary position, actually, I mean, that left eye looks possibly slightly elevated, but um, it's difficult to say that could just be um, due to some enophthalmus um, associated with their fracture. But when they look when they look up, you can see the right eye is moving up, but the left eye is not. And actually, this is more obvious when they're looking down. You can see that right eye is moving down, but that left eye is really not. And that's really in keeping with, with the Hess chart. And then um, finally, we'll move on to thyroid associated ophthalmopathy or thyroid eye disease. And this is a progressive inflammation um, and damage to the tissues around the eyes, especially the extraocular muscles, connective tissue, and fatty tissue. Patients often present with this really characteristic bilateral proctosed eyes. Okay. It's not always related to their current thyroid fun function. And in fact, actually, patients can present even when they're euthyroid. Um, we must always consider whether the optic nerve is compromised in these patients. Um, and it's more common, that's more common if there's no proptosis. Um, and that's usually because they've got quite a tight orbit and, and it's pushing back on the nerve rather than proptosing forwards. If the nerve is compromised, then there, there's usually a reduction in their visual acuity um, and their color vision, as well as reduced visual fields. And if this is the case, then an urgent orbital decompression should be considered. And actually, if you, if you, treat patients with an urgent orbital decompression quickly, and um, actually their vision can, can make a good recovery. In terms of classification of thyroid eye disease, um, so we tend to use the no specs classification. Um, so, um, so that's uh, zero would be no signs or symptoms. One would be only signs and no symptoms. So they have may have upper lid retraction or with or without lid lag. Um, number two is soft tissue involvement. Um, so you get edema of the conjunct conjunctivi and lids and conjunctival injection. Number three is proptosis, so forward bulging of the eyes. Four is extraocular muscle involvement. Five would be corneal involvement due to the inability to close the eyelids. And six is sight loss due to optic nerve involvement. So a couple of questions now on mechanical strabismus. So let's say... So which type of Duane's syndrome presents with a divergent squint, so a divergent strabismus? a little bit longer. Okay, let's 
end on there. So uh, yes, <clears throat> absolutely. So type two, um, and the way to remember the way to remember this is uh, which or the way to remember which type of Duane syndrome someone has is how many D's there are. So if it's adduction, uh, if it's abduction only affected, then it's type one. If it's adduction only affected, then it's type two. And if it's abduction and adduction, then it's type three. So if they've got a divergent strabismus, then their adduction is affected, and therefore this is type two. And then the last question is, So following a punch to the right eye, the patient is no longer able to elevate this eye and describes extreme pain on trying to look up, which extraocular muscle is most likely trapped in the orbital fracture. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A, by the way. Perfect. Just wait for, see if anybody else answers this one, and then we'll go, we'll have a look at the questions. Okay, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's usually the inferior rectus actually that's, that's trapped. Um, the inferior rectus tends to get trapped in any fracture, and, and when they try and look up, gets stuck and doesn't allow them to look up but it's also incredibly painful um so it's it's very common for for people to complain of pain um with um an orbital floor fracture and um, where the inferior rectus is trapped okay so um a couple of questions so an alternating exotropia right greater than left um left eye breaks at five centimeters of convergence cyclopedic refraction of plus 1.75 right and left, parent finds whole things close to read. How do we manage this? Um, I think it would depend on their, on their, their vision. Um, I would probably leave them, uh, it also depends whether that exotropia is constant or alternating. If it's constant, I, I would say treat the vision and I would, I would give them, give them that, that plus 1.75 if they really need it. Um, again, it, it really depends on the age of that patient as well as to whether we would want to give that. Um, and I think it's, we'd probably need a little bit more information. Um, in terms of treatment for Duane's, most, most children we don't treat um, because they actually tend to manage quite well. It depends if they've got a very big um, head turn, face turn, where they're turning their head to one side, you might want to do a muscle extraocular muscle transposition, and that's where we we surgically move the um, superior rectus and the inferior rectus around to the border of the lateral rectus to give some abducting function. Um, but in general, we don't tend to do very much for Duane's. Um, and then the last question was, uh, what's the VA cutoff for referring for amblyopia therapy, six nine or less? And I, in general, yes, around about six nine or less. Um, I would aim to give them the full refractive adaptation first of all, before referring in, so giving them the full 18 weeks of refractive adaptation, um, because their vision may improve, particularly if it's only a low level of amblyopia at 6.9. If they've got um, much denser amblyopia, say 6.15 or so, they're more likely to require amblyopia therapy and therefore it would be more sensible to refer them into to the hospitalised service. Okay. Excellent. So hopefully we've uh, I've given you um, the some understanding of amblyopia and different types of treatment that we can use to understand the different grades of binocular vision. Um, a quick overview on the diagnosis and management of esotropia. Obviously, we've only gone through sort of four types of esotropia, and there was a lot more on that chart there. Similarly, with exotropia, we've gone through a couple of the different types um, in terms of diagnosis and management. Um, and we've gone through a few of the mechanical disorders of ocular motility that we see. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will put in the chat the, um, have, you, have you managed to have a look at all the questions? Um, so I've looked at all of the uh, yeah. Q&As, um, I've not looked at the chat. The chat, the yeah. I don't know if there's anything there. There's a little bit, we've got a few minutes if possible. Fine. So what have we got? So most effective ambiopia therapy, which I think we kind of covered in the in the questions as well. Um, and then, oh, sorry, somebody couldn't see the picture of the child, so apologies. Fine. Um, so, um, so mother notices a child's eyes diverge when tired, only phoreus is seen, which breaks down. So you've got a decompensating um, or convergence weakness type exophoria. Um, I would try convergence exercises um, for this. Um, and it's whether that's something you would be happy to try in, in practice. It, if you would be happy to try that in practice, I would re usually recommend little and often. So kind of four or five times a day for one to two minutes. Um, and that's um, something that we would kind of recommend um, with relaxation afterwards. So getting them to look into the distance, much easier said um, if you're out in the country than sort of in an inner city, um, but just sort of even just resting the eyes after doing, doing the exercises is really important so that we don't give them a sort of a convergence spasm. Um, but, uh, uh, and then the last one was, uh, what's my opinion on Binox therapy? Um, I, I haven't got um, an opinion on that. Um, it's not something I've got any experience of. Um, so I would uh, say I, I, I'm not 100% sure is my answer to that one. Well, Greg, thank you very much for a very wonderful talk. It's covered a lot of ground. If there are questions afterwards, I'm sure you can contact Greg, our secretary at Clinica London. Autumn in September, we will be having Naz Raouf talking uh, on a similar sort of um, subject, in other words, neuroophthalmology and motility. And meanwhile, we wish you a, a very good summer. And Greg, thank you again for a super talk. So I Please, will you just fill in the survey for CPD points. I've just put the link on there. So some you won't be sending the survey by email. They will just get it from the chat here. Yeah, yeah they'll we get that it as well. Yes, that's great. Yeah, we keep sending it because we want you to get the points. <laughs> yeah, we want you to get the points. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry it's not face to face. We are beginning face to face, but I think in 2023. Uh, we'll invite Greg back, maybe with Naz on the same day even, and do some face-to-face, because -face. I'm missing you all, and it would be lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Greg.